All right, I guess it's time to start. This last part of the AIR conference this year is focusing a bit more on the industrial part of uh, doing AIR work, AIR sequencing, and other, other things you can do with AIR-seq data. And we have uh, three phenomenal speakers in this field. And I welcome first uh, Jacob Glanville, Dr. Jacob Glanville, I should say, because he just finished his PhD two years ago at Stanford, while at the same time, uh, successfully bringing a, bringing a company to be. Um, he's the CSO, co-founder, and chairman of the board of Distributed Bio, for which he's speaking today. And he's gonna tell us what he's been doing over the past couple of years to bring forward the AIR community and the AIR data um, as a tool to work with generating new, to work with to generate new therapeutics um, and better medicine. Jake? Yes, go. <laughs> Hello, Air community. This is my first time giving a talk in a church, and uh, I gotta say it feels right. <laughs> so I think over the last few days, we've been seeing some pretty remarkable work on the myriad applications of repertoire analysis to analyze and better understand the workings of the adaptive immune system with really cool applications in many areas. Today, I'm gonna to focus on the practical blue collar use of this data, specifically to try to ask the question that I've asked over the last 10 years, and that is, how can we engineer better medicine using these new classes of data? I'm gonna show you a set of examples in monoclonal engineering and discovery, T cell receptor engineering and vaccine design. Oh, eventually. eventually. <laughs> All right. Is the clicker? It is, great. Okay, so I started working in this space 10 years ago. I was working at a site at Pfizer and they had two different ways of generating antibodies as therapeutics. They had your trusty hybridoma, immunize a mouse, recover immortalized cells and then sequence them. And they had phage display, the technology that recently won the Nobel Prize and enables us to look through very large repertoires uh, of human antibodies. And the problem with both of these technologies is that they suck. Uh, it takes us years to develop molecules, engineer them for better therapeutic cap uh, properties, and eventually make them ready for clinic. And along the way, mistakes are made in many steps, resulting in molecules that aggregate or immunogenic and crash out of solution. They also don't produce that many hits, so we miss critical epitopes. The same problem that happens with vaccines happens when we're trying to target a drug. And I may have just been stuck being frustrated by these technologies, except that, lucky for me, around that time in 2008, uh, these, the arms race for faster, cheaper genomic sequencing resulted in us being able to acquire a 454 instrument at Pfizer. And I asked the group if I could start putting antibody sequences onto the high-throughput sequencing instrument to try to figure out why the mouse missed certain epitopes and why our libraries weren't producing as many hits as we wanted. This slide is pretty useless for this group. Everybody knows what repertoire sequencing is. Um, I'm gonna, I published the initial paper in 2009 and then 32 papers afterwards applying the technologies to ask why did the mouse miss a certain epitope and how can we improve that by asking how many unique hits are there? How similar are they across animals? How much affinity maturation and class switching and proliferation occurs within these organisms? Simple questions that are very important to be able to optimize vaccines because they give you engineering information to produce better drugs. And the second question was, can I use these technologies to build better antibody libraries so we can short circuit the typical time it makes takes to produce a drug against an interesting target and potentially go after targets that were too hard to hit previously by having quantitative control over the, the quality of the repertoire. Um, so over the next few years, I built a series of natural and synthetic libraries. And the, the power of deep sequencing was we could actually look into these libraries at a depth somewhat sample relatable to the size of these libraries. People would claim they were e to the nine or e to the 10 or even e to the 11. 
Um, and obviously, we couldn't sequence that deeply. And even with these, in these instruments, we couldn't. But we could finally sequence to e to the 6. And when we started doing that, it became very obvious that these libraries were full of redundant clones. They were about a thousandth of the size that we thought they were. Of the number of unique transformants was not the same diversity as the number of unique, unique antibody species. And then the other issue that we noticed was that when you look at the hits that come out of a library versus the composition of the library, there were strong biases. So certain parts of the library were unproductive. They were not thermostable enough or were not folding up properly. And if you could fix these two problems, you could make a library that would produce many more hits and have better quality binders. And that's what we were able to demonstrate with uh, three subsequent libraries built that produce higher affinity hits and more hits against a TCSK9 as a representative drug target. This is pretty exciting rapid development for a field that had remained relatively flat since the inception of the technology. So I'm gonna walk briefly through our current library technology and show you some cool applications that we're working on with the Gates Foundation, the US military, and about 35 pharmaceutical companies. Um, there are two areas that we can use data to optimize antibody libraries. The first is in the framework selection. This is called developability optimization, and the idea is that not all antibodies are equal. That an antibody that your body produces is not good enough in most cases to become a therapeutic that can be concentrated, shelf stable, and injected into a population that has genetic variability. So what we do is we downsample from the 50-ish V genes and 70-ish uh, VH genes and 70-ish V kappa and lambda genes to pick the subset that are gonna make good therapeutics. In the interest of time here, I'll go light, but the point is, we use 1,000 Genomes Project data and uh, IGH genomics work to identify V genes that are found in all human populations. So we don't accidentally make a racist medicine that's gonna appear less human in some, some in individuals. So we avoid copy number variant sites. We avoid uh, polymorphic V genes that have different alleles and homozygotes in certain populations. We pick V genes that have been used frequently by other groups already. This is an act of cowardice to avoid being the first person to put the wrong V gene as a therapeutic into a human. And each little V gene has its own ugly or delightful story. The ugly stories are things like IGHV4-34. It's inherently autoreactive uh, to glycoproteins on lymphocytes. It's actually used as a marker in lupus because of the variability and exclusion from terminal centers. Uh, people should have known this and they should never have produced a drug on this V gene. But the three groups that have put those into clinic have found that they have a half-life that's like less than a third of a normal antibody because of an off-target sink. And there are a bunch of examples of VGENs you should never build a drug on for these kinds of reasons. And the nice thing about a library that you've built and controlled is you can choose to selectively eject those to build a repertoire of controlled engineering conditions of, of ideal properties. So thermostable and aggregation resistant and so forth. I can talk about this at great length, but I'm gonna keep going because there's a second problem. You can have the greatest scaffolds in the world and they're not going to help you if your diversity isn't great. So we embarked on an expedition using repertoire sequencing to figure out how much diversity actually is there in your blood, within a person and across people, within the CD27 negative and positive naive and memory compartments and the different isotypes and the individual CDRs. And what it taught us was a way to build a totally human library that was radically more diverse than libraries that were previously possible. So this is a fully human repertoire, but it's computationally optimized. Uh, on the left there, I'm showing an example. This is a, we've taken the, the most frequent clones in each sample. These are previous libraries reported, human memory, human naive, compared to this new library we built. And we're saying the top 1,000 clones, what percentage of the entire repertoire does that represent? How about the top 10,000 clones? And what you can see is these previous libraries that have been published, the top 20,000 clones or so represented 70% of the entire diversity. So even though they claim that was a library of e to, the, e to the 10, it was actually more like e to the 7 because of a limited number of clones that were wasting a lot of space. When you fix this, as we were able to do, we end up producing an insane number of hits against a whole bunch of interesting therapeutic drug targets. So thousands of hits rather than like 50 or 60. And when you have huge numbers of hits, it means you can start accessing epitopes that you would have missed otherwise. It means that the direct affinities coming out of these libraries are in the picomolar range rather than 100 nanomolar, which is really exciting because that's the kind of technology where you, you can pan a library much faster than you can immunize an animal, but typically you have to do affinity maturation afterwards. If you can skip affinity maturation, then you have a technology that can produce a picobolar binder in a few weeks, and that's the technology you want in your pocket when the, pond the zombie apocalypse strikes, because it's gonna give you the ability to produce ultra high affinity binders very quickly against novel pathogens. That's a technology that was not available in the Ebola crisis. So once we produced this, we got pretty excited, and we started working with a variety of partners, I'm gonna tell a couple stories, going after traditionally hard targets, because if we had 5,000 hits against each epitope, an entire repertoire against the target, we could start uh, achieving engineering breakthroughs that were previously challenging to accomplish. 
I'm going to go and mostly focus on the HIV case, the GPCRs a bit, and a few of these other applications. So this is a cool one. Um, a buddy of mine, Peter Kim, was a professor at Stanford and used to be the CSO of Merck. He contacted me because they'd identified, him and another group had identified this semi-conserved epitope on HIV. And they wanted to be able to identify broadly neutralizing antibodies against it to ask, could a broadly neutral, broad binder be neutralizing? And they tried a couple other technologies, but these are very polymorphic proteins. And we were able to go in because we had this huge repertoire where other technologies like yeast display and in vivo immunization had failed. We produced hundreds of binders in under four weeks. So their, their team actually stopped, had to stop sending them new clones. And we have some of them in here that were neutralizing at single digit nanomolar in almost all cases, all the different viral variations that they were able to encounter. So this is the ability to create broadly neutralizing binders against the most challenging targets and do that in weeks. And this is part of the reason we got contacted by the military. Uh, in another case, oh, and the other exciting thing about this is these antibodies, unlike the HIV antibodies that have been characterized so far that often are heavily infinity matured and mutated and they have thermostability and aggregation problems, these things are very clean. So it's not an inherent requirement to hit HIV that you need a tortured antibody. You can have a perfectly normal looking antibody if you have a sufficiently large repertoire. It seems intuitive when you say it, but uh, this is not clear to, to everyone. And this is something that's been demonstrated here that repertoire optimization results in better molecules. As a second example, we've started going after GPCRs and ion channels. And we've got a series of pretty exciting successes. So the work I'm about to show you is a graduate student in my group who's since been hired. Um, she generated three functionally active antagonists against the class A GPCR CXCR5 as part of her internship. Um, we used two techniques here. One is the very large library, and the other one was to use high throughput sequencing during our planning selections to identify clones which are enriching against the target, but not against a series of off-target cell classes. And then we have a way to synthesize those clones directly and test them. Um, this is just showing they're functionally active, they look nice, they stain efficiently. And they have these remarkable thermostability properties. And again, this is another class where, because they were so difficult to target, you started hearing people come up with these goofy theories that, well, maybe human repertoires are not suited to target a GPCR. Maybe you need a, like a chicken or a llama or something. And I think these are philosophies based on despair. Just, it was hard to hit. And so people start coming up with crazy excuses for why. And it, it, it really does not require that. It's a probability function. You just need more shots on goal and you will eventually hit the goal. And again, these are great behaved molecules. We can get high thermostability, aggregation resistance, excellent expression, because they don't have a lot of crazy mutations and they'd be suitable for therapeutic application. You just need a very large library and use sequencing to help analyze the molecules that are emerging against this expected target. This is another example of a group who's building a precision medicine therapeutic platform where they want to have a patient who comes in who has a B cell lymphoma. And B cell lymphoma is sexy because unlike most other cancers, it actually, the lymphoma was all derived from a starting clone, and that clone has a unique B cell receptor. So you actually have, know up front, a priori, the, re the receptor, the target that's present on the tumor and not anywhere else. And a guy named Ron Levy at Stanford like 25 years ago showed that you could indeed produce, he produced rat serum against the B cell receptor. You'd have to inject like the receptor, shave it off the, the patient's tumors, inject it into 100 rats, take the juice of 100 rats and inject that back into the patient. Um, that's not a great therapeutic, but he was able to induce permanent remission in about 20% of the patients who received that. So this group now heard about our technology and they're basically creating a precision platform where that patient can come in and within three to four weeks, they can have a picomolar binder against that person, a fully human picomolar binder against that person's B cell lymphoma. And this is showing the in vivo results of our molecule here compared to not treatment where most of the animals die. Uh, Rituximab and anti-IgM, where we're getting slightly superior results to rituximab, um, because rituximab, ultimately, you can shave off that target, but it's harder to eliminate the B cell receptor. The whole B cell's life is centered around making sure that B cell receptor is present, so it makes a superior target if only you can target it quickly. Last example is just uh, one that's known to many of us, PD-1. Um, so we panned PD-1, and we got 6,500 hits. About 80% crossed to cell lines. Um, we found 25 molecules that hit human, mouse, and cyano, so rare epitopes that other technologies had not been able to access. And that's very useful for, for therapeutic uh, testing, where you want the mouse to be a relevant model of the disease process. Um, we had hits that came out of the library that were more functionally active than Nevo and Pembro without any affinity maturation. So we've already partnered some of these molecules with five different groups, and more groups are coming to us. I actually thought PD-1 was over. I thought I was just doing it for a demonstration case for a paper. But then a bunch of groups came to me and said, oh, we'd really like agonists or antagonists or a weird epitope. And we have them all in the, 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 the fridge for them. 
Um, so part of the reason we're able to attack these problems quickly is we've built up this kind of conveyor belt of a whole bunch of robots and toys to be able to run these things pretty quickly. So we do panning on magnetic bead manipulation robot that we've hacked to do phage panning. Uh, we have robots to pick clones, rearray them, perform high throughput kinetic sensing and high throughput fluorescence activated cell sorting tests in uh, multiplex formats. And that gives us the ability right now comfortably and where we can hit that three to four week window to get the single chain FBs, and then there's more time to IgG convert them. But we're talking with the military about using this to be able to go faster. So if you have you know, the zombie apocalypse, like the new outbreak takes place, we could do this thing in about half the time. So we can produce remarkably high affinity neutralizing binders, and we've proven already on HIV and flu that we can do this in a remarkably short period of time. So we're working with them, we're exploring things like Hantavirus and Lassa and a couple other platforms where we can switch out the antigen variants between rounds and come up with a broad neutralizing binder extremely quickly. Um, there are other applications that are interesting potentially to this group is that we have huge numbers of hits. So we get 5,000 and 9,000 unique hits against each target. So we've built up this database and we're starting to apply machine learning tools to try to understand similar to what I did with T cell receptors, but now using machine learning more vigorously to go to what extent can we identify specificity against an inc ever increasing population of known binders directly from sequence. Uh, in the future here, is eventually the antibody printer. So a closed circuit where humans aren't involved in this process, which we could, we could reduce this thing down to about four days. And that, that would be, I really can't emphasize enough how revolutionary that would be to be able to go in, put in your antigens, and then four or five days later, you have therapeutic molecules popping out or tools to be able to ask new questions in a routine fashion against um, any given living system. All right, so that's the antibody stuff. I have a shorter talk about T cell receptors. I just wanna make one point here. So I applied a question to the T cell receptors a few years ago, the, the big question that annoyed me about repertoire analysis was that I could sequence millions of clones. I could learn about V-gene frequencies and somatic hypermutation and clonal expansion and create single linkage lineage trees and all of that was wonderful. But the thing that I cared about the most was still not available to me. And that was like pumping through my veins, what, is, what have I reacted to? And that's so annoying to me that you couldn't just read that from the sequence. And so it's the beginning of a way to try to fix that I developed this method of convergence where I said, I suspect that T cell receptors or, or antibodies that are binding the same thing in the same orientation may be very conserved on the share common features. And we should be able to statistically detect that. And I chose T cell receptors first because they have a very constrained interface and they dock in a certain orientation. So I thought the possibility of detection would be easier in T cell receptors. So with Mark Davis, we developed this tool and this is showing clusters of T cell receptors with kind of dominant cluster or a couple of dominant clusters of solutions that T cell receptors come to to dock and recognize certain peptides. And powerfully, we were able to predict these um, and then use it as a, as a decloaking exercise to figure out what the antigen targets are quite quickly. Um, as part of the review process, one of our reviewers was like, if your algorithm is so good, and I don't know if they're British, I'm just guessing they were, if your algorithm is so good, you should be able to run it in reverse and spit out de novo T cell, T cell receptors. And I thought we could do this. So what we did is we took examples. So this is a set of 10 T cell receptors that came from subjects against a tuberculosis target. This is a positional weight matrix, which is summarizing which amino acid frequencies were found and not found across these groups. This, since you have this, you can then easily calculate the predicted probability of any T cell receptor that could emerge from that positional weight matrix. And they're ranked here. Well, you can see in yellow were the ones that actually were found in patients. So we picked 10. There was high probability as possible, so the highest score, but they were at least two amino acids away from anything found in nature. We picked 10 because we weren't sure they were all going to work. I just needed a couple of successes to get, push the paper through. And uh, eight out of the 10 were successful, and two of them were more active than anything that was found within the subjects. So not only was the prediction strong, but it actually provided a mechanism for optimization of the function that these were selected under, which was activity. And that, that's pretty exciting because that's suddenly an engineering tool to allow you to pick and even optimize T cell receptors, predict their function based on, based on, based on um, similarity to other related members. And I'll leave you with the concept here that the ability to predict the, the scoring function to predict new members with best properties is really the same math run in reverse as the detection function to be able to look at a T cell receptor and I, be, I believe that thing binds to uh, you know, EAE peptide on this particular HLA background, that it's the same functions you could use to synthesize novel T cell receptors with optimized properties. I'm probably gonna go long, but this is really cool. So the last piece I'm gonna talk about um, is fundamentally different than the first two, right? With the first two, I showed you how in an in vitro system where I have an in vitro controlled repertoire, 
I can optimize its functions to accelerate antibody discovery. Then I showed you in vitro how I could analyze sets of T cell receptors to synthesize a molecule. In this last story, I'm gonna tell you about the, the case where you don't get to control the repertoire, and that's in vivo immunization for vaccine science. Um, here, what you get to control are the antigens. And so I was particularly interested, in, again, in, in broad spectrum vaccine science, and I wanted to understand, really the simple question is why the hell do we miss? Why do we get a flu shot every year, but most of us don't produce antibodies against the conserved site that would be broadly neutralizing, even though it's there every year? It's a frustrating, uh, an irritating area of medicine. And again, I, I, I see a lot of really goofy arguments about nebulous concepts involving immunodominance. And it, it feels a little bit to me like we're, um, we're, you know, we're reading like what people call like the ethers before the advent of like modern concepts of how energy transfer was performed. And I, so I didn't like that. And I wanted to come up with a, use this high throughput data to come up with a more mechanistic and probabilistic model of the nature of immunodominance. Because I thought if we were able to do that, we could come up with a better vaccine technology. So, the community is at large, at large, not just me, all of us together in the last 10 years have helped us identify that humans have about 10 to the seven, maybe up to 10 to the eight unique B cell receptors, less than people thought before the advent of these technologies. When you vaccinate someone with a flu shot, about a thousand unique lineages emerge, surprisingly few. And then when you look at the serology from Giorgio's work and others, it's really about eight of the two. So about a hundred unique antibody, about a hundred unique B cells are dumping out antibody that's providing serological protection. That's, that's small. It's an interesting number, and it begs the question then, well, how many epitopes are there? If there's less than 100 epitopes, maybe you're hitting them all. But if it's less than that, maybe you're missing interesting ones. And so we, I conducted a protein-protein docking study where I took proteins, and I wasn't trying to figure out the correct site. I was just trying to ask, how are all the different ways that antibody could be bound to hemagglutinin or a protein of that size? And it turns out there's hundreds of thousands of unique binding solutions that are possible on that surface. And the problem is actually nightmarishly more complicated because we know that an antibody might bind 25 residues, but it really might only be 10 or 15 that are relevant for our binding, and the rest are in contact but could be mutated. That becomes an in-choose-k problem, and when you consider those, you're really in the space of having billions of possible epitopes. And we have a database that sort of manages this massive model of all the epitopes. And once you have that database, you can ask, okay, well, across thousands of different versions of hemagglutinin and those billions of epitopes, what percentage of them are universally neutralizable? What percentage of them are less so? And this gives a very clear understanding of what the hell is going on. It's that the broadly neutralizing epitopes are incredibly rare compared to the majority of epitopes that, that are not. It's about one in a million. And that explains why we miss. It's just a function of probability. We don't need to invoke, invoke any more kind of complicated mystic forces. It also informed us on a new way to be able to coerce the immune system to shift that distribution to favor more broad spectrum responses. So Sarah Ives uh, is the project lead for some work, two slides I'm about to show you on a really exciting in vivo broad spectrum technology we've developed to target, to cause the immune system to preferentially target a, a, monop a monopoly of different conserved epitopes. What I'm showing you here are seven pigs in each of these groups who received a flu shot. These pigs basically got salt water and they didn't really respond at all to a whole panel of about a century of influenza from 1918 all the way up to modern times. Over here, this is a standard flu shot. You can see these pigs responded pretty well to the thing in the flu and a few years before and after, but otherwise it largely goes away. This is the annoying flu shot properties that we know and love. And then over here, you're seeing our, what technology we call Centivax, where we're co co selectively coercing broad, spec broad spectrum B cell receptors to proliferate, activate class switch and produce serological protection. And here we've got a reactivity to a century of hemagglutinin. It's pretty much everything in the panel, including in red, things that were not is part of the, the vaccine itself. So that this works by immunizing with a large collection of different hemagglutinins that were, are each at a very low dose. So that B cells that recognize a single strain have too low of a dose to activate, whereas B cells that recognize conserved epitopes end up getting up to 30-fold higher dose. And so you're preferentially rewarding B cells to activate as a function of the conservation of the epitope they recognize. We're coupling conservation and con concentration. This is a neutralization study. So this is Sarah growing up in, in a panel of viruses. And so we pretended the study was 2007, and we immunized either against salt water, which does nothing, 2007 vaccine, which produces good neutralizing titers against the two strains in the vaccine, extremely little elsewhere, a little bit of the future H3. So these are future viruses beyond the point of the vaccine. Or this is our Cinevax, which produced, again, using only information from 2007 or earlier, we produced neutralization back to 1934, and we crossed to future viruses, including a pandemic uh, swine flu. 
So a pandemic shift virus. So this is a really powerful result as a function of the kind of work that we do here to understand why the repertoire fails and how to gear it towards success. And it's resulting in our ability to cross neutralize future pandemic strains and create a general platform to target uh, broad spectrum vaccines against polymorphic pathogens. And there's a lot of these. So we're talking to a number of interested groups right now, and we're trying to basically run pilot studies on a number of these to figure out where the low hanging fruit is um, as we expand this technology. You're gonna be hearing a, a lot about this um, in the near future as the papers come out and some, some more work that I can't announce yet is gonna come forward. So that's the platform. Um, this is my team. I'd, prefer, prefer, I'd specifically like to thank Sarah Ives for driving the vaccine work, uh, Dave Maurer, for a lot of the, the antibody superhuman technology and then everyone else that we've grown up around us. Um, we have about 20 people, so it's, it's not a huge team, but I think that's the point of the technologies we have here and a general thing I wanna leave you with, and that is that if you have a lot more data, then you don't have to fly blind in synthetic engineering and bioengineering. The, the data will guide you because we can take advantage of 600, and, uh, 600 million years of evolutionary history to figure out how antibodies fold well, how they're tolerated in systems, why they fail, and how can we create rational solutions to engineer better monoclonal therapeutics, better T cell receptors, and better vaccines. With that, I'd like to thank you and take any questions if you have them. Thank you, Jake. That was a wonderful talk. Um, unfortunately, we don't have much time for questions right now. But Jake's going to be part of the industry reception that's going to happen right after that. And I suggest you just um, go there and ask the questions and can discuss things with him at length.